This is Decision 2013. Tonight from BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, before a live audience, a democratic debate for public advocates under the auspices of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And now, here is New York One political anchor, Errol Lewis. Good evening. Welcome to the first live Democratic primary debate in the race for public advocate. I'm Errol Lewis, and I'm joined in tonight's debate here at BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, by Brian Lehrer, the host of WNYC's Brian Lehrer Show, Juan Manuel Benitez, the host of Pura Politica on New York One Noticias, and Courtney Gross, a political reporter for New York One. The next 60 minutes will be an uninterrupted conversation about issues where you will get a chance to learn more about the five Democratic candidates seeking to become our city's next public advocate. First in line in succession to the mayor, the public advocate is the city's chief ombudsman and can also introduce legislation in the city council. The public advocate also makes appointments to key city boards and commissions. Tonight's debate is part of New York City's official debate program for the 2013 elections. It's administered by the Campaign Finance Board. The board runs the city's public matching funds program, which is designed to strengthen the role of average New Yorkers who make small dollar contributions. The CFB selects partners to bring these debates to New Yorkers, and tonight's debate is sponsored by New York One News, New York One Noticias, the Citizens Union of the City of New York, the Hispanic Federation, the Citizens Committee for New York City, Gothamist, Transportation Alternatives, WNYC, and Time Warner Cable. So without further ado, let's introduce the five candidates. They are Sadiq Y, Letitia James, Reshma Saujani, Kathy Guerrero, and Daniel Squadron. These candidates will generally have one minute to respond to questions and will also be given an opportunity to respond if they are addressed directly by an opponent. We'll also have what we call a cross-examination, where each candidate will be able to ask one opponent a question. There will also be, of course, a lightning round in the middle of the debate in which candidates will be allowed to answer only yes or no to each question. And the candidates will also have 30-second closing statements. Be sure to tweet at us during this debate. You can use the hashtag PubAd. P-U-B-A-D-V 2013. P-U-B-A-D-V 2013. <laughs> so with that, we are ready to begin. By random selection, we have determined that Sadiq Y will get the first question, and that will come from Brian Lehrer. Thanks, Errol. Well, as Errol noted, the office that you're seeking is one with limited power and limited resources, but I think it's also one that can make a real difference on a few issues that you can choose, uh, that you choose to focus on. So I wonder which of you can really make our viewers and listeners care enough to vote. In one minute each, tell us how you as public advocate would make New York a better place. Mr. Y. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for sponsoring uh, New York One for sponsoring this debate. The job of the public advocate is an extremely important job. Uh, other than people like Mark Green, who actually set the pace for that office really doing something, I seek to take in the office of public advocate as a real office that is inclusive, an office that will work for the people who have been left out of the city, an office that would be there to bring people together. And I would do it on the basis of my three principles. And that is the ACT principle. A standing for accountability, C standing for collaboration, and T standing for transparency. There's so many things that happen in the city. Too many people have been left out. There's two cities in the hill. I want to make sure that we have one New York where all races, all communities, gender, sex, could work in the city and make this place a better place to live. Thank you. Ms. James. So the Office of Public Advocate has five basic functions under the charter, which is the Constitution of the City of New York. One, to introduce legislation. Two, you have some very key appointments. And clearly, the one appointment that I'm really focused on is the appointment of city planning. Unfortunately, in this district, and I welcome all of you to my district, there's a significant number of people who are being displaced as a result of the, the high, rising rents. There's growing income, to in dispa di in growing income dis inequality in the City of New York. There's a significant number of individuals who can no longer survive in the City of New York. So it's really important that as the next public advocate, that on the city planning, we sh really should focus on the crisis in affordable housing and ensure that there is more housing for low and moderate income people in the city of New York, including the fact that tonight 52,000 individuals are homeless, most of them children, and that it's unacceptable in, the, in our democracy. Thank you. Mr. Johnny. Thank you. I want to thank New York One and the partners and my husband for being here tonight. Um, I've been the deputy public advocate. 
And I've been very clear, I want to reinvent this office. In April, I, I put forth a reorg of that office. I want to have four deputy public advocates, a public advocate for housing, for jobs, for education, and for women. We have a jobs crisis in our city. Many people can't find work, and we need to retrain our workforce to get them jobs in the 21st century, and I've already started doing that. In education, through my program, Girls Who Code, we've seen what is possible when we teach young girls and we get them untrapped in technology. I want to put computer science education in every single public school. When it comes to housing, our landlord-tenant courts are a mess. I will build an army of lawyers in my office to represent tenants. And finally, I am an unabashed advocate for women. And right now, we have the feminization of poverty in our city. Latina women are making 60 cents on every dollar. We need to have paid parental leave, affordable daycare, and really close the pay equity gap. The public advocate has to stand up for the most vulnerable. It has to be for women, children, immigrants, and seniors. Thank you very much. Ms. Guerrero? Yes. The point of the public advocate's office is to stand in the gap, to say this shall not pass, to say there's more to the story. I run against a set of politicians, and the point is to be outside of the system, to say there's more, things can be thought of differently. We don't come at angles, we don't come at life at angles, we come at life straight. And as the non-politician, I think about this office and I say, it's time. It's time to think clearly. It's time to think about the working class and the working poor and the middle class who've been excised from power from their own lives. I'm a mother and a wife and an educator, and I stand in the gap for those voices unheard. I think about this office very differently because, in fact, I am different. And Mr. Squadron. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and thank all of you for being here and tuning in. You know, the public advocate has the potential to play a vital role in our city. We have a big city, and uh, there's a huge number of issues, communities, individuals that are simply left out, left behind, have nowhere to turn. They're overlooked orphans in our political system. You know, in New York City, we have more than 4,000 adult, mentally ill adults who are going to see their housing situation fundamentally change over the next few years. 8,000 immigrant day laborers, uh, most of whom don't have any of the worker protections most workers take for granted. 12,000 foster kids, 14,000 people in city jails. Last night, 51,000 people went to bed homeless, 21,000 of them were kids. Nearly 500,000 New Yorkers live in public housing. Not one of these communities has a proportional political voice in our system. Certainly none of high-powered lobbyists or city hall on speed dial. That's where the public advocate comes in. Its job is to take on these communities and figure out how to get real results. As public advocate, I would divide the office into four bureaus. An advocate for the most vulnerable, an advocate for children who are too often muted in the political process, an accountability advocate to stand up for a bureaucracy that is too often not transparent and doesn't serve any New Yorker well, and a housing advocate, because housing is such a critical part of our city's future. Thank you very much. As a quick follow-up for all of you, a question suggested by one of our behind-the-scenes partners, which city agency would be your top or first priority in investigating its poor performance, and what reforms would you pursue? Very briefly on this, Mr. Y. First priority, because of its poor performance, which city agency? Well, I would first of all start with my own agency, because my principle of act, accountability, transparency, uh, collaboration and transparency, rather than investigating them, I would make sure that the NYPD comes together with civil society to sit down and fix this portion of question of stop, question of fresh. I am the only candidate on this podium and in this city who has the credibility to bring people together to be able to work together on this very, very troubling public safety Ms. issue. Ms. James, which city agency? Department of Education. The results that came most recently in regards to Common Core suggest that we have a problem in the Department of Education. As opposed to teaching to the test, what we need is a full rounded basic education for individuals. We need to provide arts and culture, and we need to make sure that teachers are respected in the city of New York. And, we, and unfortunately, under this administration, he has single-handedly dismantled education in the city of New York. Ms. Sojani, which agency is Department first? of Education. You know, we have to really look at the fact that we are closing schools in the poorest of neighborhoods, that 60% of our ELL students aren't graduating from public school, that the majority of our kids that are going to CUNY have to take remedial classes, that we are not teaching our kids anything that is preparing them for the future. Instead of having a political debate about education in this city, let's start teaching our kids something that they can go out and get jobs. And that's exactly what I've done as the founder of Girls Who Code. All right. Ms. Guerrero? As the lone 
educator in this race. And as a mother, I know this. 12 years of mayoral control has been an abject failure on the backs of the New York City public school children. Every single stakeholder, everyone who's got skin in the game has been removed from power. Parents, teachers, principals, community activists, we need to aggressively pursue, and as somebody who is in fact expert in this, aggressively pursue a reduction and a change in the law so the power goes back on the ground where it belongs. Mr. Squadron, which agency? Oh, I try to do two, Department of Correction and NYCHA. You know, we have a crisis in our city jails. Uh, the use of solitary confinement is increasing, while in many less progressive places all around the country it's decreasing. Uh, uh, the uh, violence in the jails is being underreported. There's a jail full of teenagers who haven't been convicted of felonies for the most part, where the kids have been deputized to keep order and safety. Someone has to look at that, and no one is, and that's why the public advocate is here. And NYCHA, the idea of a more than 300-day uh, wait list to get your apartment fixed, that would never stand in the private housing market, and it shouldn't stand in public housing either. Thank you all for your responses. Errol? I've got, I've got a follow-up, um, slightly different. Uh, the public advocate has the ability to introduce legislation in the city council. Um, in three and a half months, if you are elected, let's give you a day off to, to celebrate uh, the day that you get sworn in, but then you've got to get to work. And um, what would be your number one legislative priority and why? Let's go quickly, Mr. Y. The first and most important legislation I look at, this city, there are a lot of people hemorrhaging, don't have jobs. How we introduce a major reform bill dealing with bringing manufacturing in the city of New York. There are too many jobs. There are too many people who go out of a job who, who don't have jobs. In New York City in 2010, you lost, we lost over 200,000 manufacturing jobs. So I will make sure that all of these billions of dollars of city contracts that are given to people, that we look at reforming that conditionalizing it to making sure that if somebody is coming to displace mom and pop operations in the city or in the communities that there is that community conscience so that people just don't come and take the money and run because we've seen too many of that and leaving people with nothing and I will insist that these people who have corporate welfare that that corporate welfare is now going to be turned in community conscience welfare so that the people themselves who live in that community could be able to uh, and a better living and keep their family food on that table. Thank you, Ms. James. I would work with the mayor of the city of New York to ensure that all municipal contracts in the city of New York are negotiated and individuals who unfortunately work for the city of New York who have gotten gone without a raise and gone without a contract under this administration are given their fair due. It's really critically important that we respect municipal workers, that we cease and desist from outsourcing municipal services in the city of New York, and that we do it in a respectful manner and recognize that city workers are not the villain in the city of New York. It's actually Wall Street who unfortunately has gone undetected and undisciplined and unprosecuted. Ms. Aljani, your legislation. Paid parental leave. You know, in 1976, 18% of women worked and had children. That number is 86% today. But we have absolutely not changed any structures to make it possible for women to do that. The United States is one of three nations, Swaziland and Liberia, that doesn't have paid leave. That is embarrassing. There was just a study that came out that said the majority of breadwinners are now women. And they're often single women who can barely put food on the table. So I would introduce paid parental leave because we need an advocate who is going to fight for women. And I've already started doing that two weeks ago when I launched my project Up to Us to change the conversation from scandal to substance to say that it is enough and that we need an advocate who is going to stand up for women who are going to fight for the issues that affect women. And I will do that because I've already done that. Thank you. Ms. Guerrero. I'm going to focus hard on those union contracts not negotiated in good faith. As the unequivocal union candidate in this, ca in this race, 47 unions and counting, the cops and the firemen and the EMS and the EMTs and the trades and the longshoremen and on and on and on have said what I know, that the, the horror of New York City not negotiating with its unions one, two, three, four years is outrageous. And the public advocate, I, will stand in the gap and say, we've had enough. I have a proposal to give the community education councils more of a partnership with the public advocate and the borough presidents, because these are the parents' voices in our schools, which really have been muted and don't have the role they should in public schools. My wife, who's here today, and I have a two-year-old. He's going to go to public school, and if we're told we have no role in his education, we will pull our hair out. 
I would introduce legislation to help community education councils and the public advocate get together to increase parents' voices school by school, neighborhood by neighborhood, but also citywide. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Juan Manuel Benitez. Thank you, Earl. And a uh, few people know, but uh, if uh, the mayor dies, uh, you would be basically the mayor and you will have to govern for up to two months until a new election is held. So it would be a really difficult time, a time of a major crisis in the city. What would be the first action you take? And do you think you're qualified to be mayor of New York City? Ms. James. I'm a former public defender, a former assistant attorney general, a former counsel in the state legislature, and have served in the city council now for, not, not, for 10 years. I've gone up against special interests in the borough of Brooklyn and throughout the city of New York. I recognize that I have been a thorn to uh, bureaucracy and those who, who represent the elite and throughout the city of New York. And it's really critically important that we have a public advocate who represents the voices of all New Yorkers, those who have been ignored and have not been part of the discussion in New York City. And clearly, given all of those qualifications, given all of that experience, given a record of accomplishment, and the fact that I've been a fearless and, tire and tireless advocate in the city of New York, I am uniquely qualified to be the mayor of the city of New York for two months. <laughs> and the first action that you would take? The first action that I would take, obviously, is focusing on the crisis in affordable housing in the city of New York and the fact that a significant number of women have been deceived by reproductive clinics in the city of New York and the Department of Ec Education, unfortunately, has failed our children. Thank you. Ms. Aujani, are you ready? I am ready. Um, I think one of the things that distinguishes me from the other uh, candidates on this stage is I've been an executive. I've built something from scratch. When Bill asked me, when Bill de Blasio asked me to take over the Fund for Public Advocacy, there was nothing there. And I built the Fund for, Advoca Fund for Public Advocacy from scratch. I raised almost an additional million dollars of programming. When undocumented students in the city couldn't go to college because the city council had cut the Peter Valone scholarship and because Albany hasn't passed the DREAM Act, I built a scholarship program for them and sent these young kids to school. When we saw that the EDC was spending too much time focused on big business rather than small business, I did the first ever survey of immigrant entrepreneurs. I hired organizers to walk from neighborhood to neighborhood to ask them what they needed. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, called me to thank me for the work that I had done and to tell me that he was going to take my model and take it all across the country. And finally, when I saw that young women were trapped in a technology gap, that the domestic issue of our nation's time is the fact that we don't have enough people going in the technology related fields. I didn't hold a press conference. I built an organization. I built Girls Who Code, which is a nationally recognized organization that is changing lives all across the country. And, and so I know how to run things. Action? My first action will be to make sure that we are continuing to create jobs because I assume in that crisis people will be feeling really scared and our markets will go through turmoil and we need to have stability. Thank you. Ms. Guerrero, are you ready? To all things, there is a season. And this is not my season to run for the mayor of New York City. I'm running for public advocate. And I will be the next public advocate. And my first job, if and when something like, like you described happened, will be to let the city know that I will be a steward in these few months and hand the job back over to the next mayor, whomever he or she might be. But I am uniquely qualified, as I mentioned, to be the public advocate. I worked for the Archdiocese of New York for 10 years. I was the director of planning, the director of the papal visit. I know how to do things and get things done. I'm a professor of education policy. I come from a working class background. I come from the working class, three generations of union workers, my family and this city were built by these unions. They need to be held harmless. I am running and only running to be the next public advocate of New York, of New York City. And the first action that you would take? To let the city know I don't want this job yet. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Quadri. Thank you. Uh, if the situation arose, I would certainly be prepared. As has been referenced, the city charter has this right. You assume uh, the job for a couple of for 60 days to a few months. And the first thing I would do is I would keep the current administration in place, talk to leaders across government, and communicate to New Yorkers that they can be secure in their government while they choose who the next mayor will be. You know, uh, the most important thing in a situation like that, or in any tough situation in my experience, is you've got to bring people together even on tough issues. You know, when this administration was charging rent to families in homeless shelter, we beat the drum and we got together with advocates, but we also brokered an agreement to end that policy. One of the only times in 11 and a half years that this administration and the leading homeless advocates have come together around a policy in a situation that was very high stakes after Sandy. 
or my district was not nearly as devastated as some parts of the city, but was very severely impacted. We rolled up our sleeves, got on the ground, and filled in the gaps in the city's plan, both uh, communicating to City Hall what had to happen and making sure that in our area, we did everything possible. Thank you, Mr. Y. Are I'm you the qualified? I'm the only candidate on this stage that has a job that involves the entire city of New York. I serve as the senior highest civilian in the police department of the city of New York. You don't have the luxury to be a council person. You serve all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. I have been to 83 community, plan, community centers, 83 precincts in this city covering 8.3 million people. I put my life on the line every single day. I'm the only one that stands at this table right now that has done something specifically in the area of healthcare. I forced the mayor of the city of New York to lift in the moratorium. I brought about SUNY Downstate Medical Center to partner with community businesses. <laughs> and most importantly, contrary to what Wina is taking my proposal, I'm the only one that put on the table specifically this question of stop, question and frisk, why people are holding press conferences. I said, it's easy. You put a lapel pin, where police officers on their, on, their, on, their, on, their, on their shields, I guarantee you that stop and freeze will go down the drain. And what would be your first action as mayor? My first action as mayor, which I've always done in controversies, is to bring people together, all communities, all leaders, because far too often when we want to do bring people together, we are going to people who we know. This city is a city of immigrants. I am a first generation African American who does not pay any deference to other communities. I work with mayors, I work with senior citizens, I work with youths, I work with immigrants, I work with Think. rabbis, I work with everybody. <laughs> so I'm the most qualified person here to bring about unification in the city. Thank you. Our next question comes from Courtney Gross. Thanks, Errol. Uh, we want to turn to crime and public safety. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, the Bloomberg administration will be filing paperwork to start the appeals process on this week's stop and frisk decision that found that the practice violated the Constitution. So we want to know whether or not you think stop and frisk should end, should it be mended, or should it re the practice remain as it is now? And uh, Ms. Guerrero, we know that you were endorsed by the PBA. Uh, you mentioned that earlier, so let's start with you. Yes. Stop and frisk is a tool. The problem is not the tool. The problem is the context of New York City policing. We're down 7,000 cops. We're down 30% of our detective force. There is a quota system that aggressively shifts the conversation on the street of the cops. And we need to address these contextual issues. Regarding the, the two bills in City Hall, I disagree with both of them. There is a problem, but those bills are not the solution. Can you be more specific about what the solution might be? I know, it's, I know it's not those bills. I know that they look at a tool, they look at a policy and blame the policy as opposed to saying we need better training. We need to get the, these young men and women who come into the force up and running and understanding communities better, community policing, CPOP, community, com community patrol on the ground. If we address those concerns, of which, by the way, the NYPD and its rank and file also agree with, we know there are issues. The problem is it's not us versus them. It's coming together and an advocate can actually bridge that gap. I'm actually uniquely qualified to do so. I've been meeting with community activists all over the city, 1,000 meetings and counting with men and women who represent each of the communities that have issues. And I've also clearly gotten the endorsement of those men and women who are, you know, organizing with, with the rank and file. And with my ability to bridge the gap between this and that, we can actually have an honest conversation about what the future of the city holds. Mr. Squadron. Uh, yes, we have to fundamentally reform stop and frisk. And in fact, I've carried the bill that changes the uh, marijuana laws in the state and the unequal way they've been enforced. Uh, look, I support both of the bills before the city council, uh, but let's talk about those marijuana laws for a second. Today, if you have a small amount of marijuana in your pocket, it's not a crime. You take it out of your pocket, it is. Well, do you know that you are nine to 10 times more likely to get a criminal record for carrying a small amount of marijuana in Manhattan and Brooklyn if you're black or Latino than if you're white? That is simply wrong. None of us should want to live in a city where there's that kind of racial disparity in what constitutes a crime. Our son will hopefully never carry a small amount of marijuana with him, but if he does, he's almost certain not to get a criminal record. His friend, who happens to be a person of color, 
nearly 10 times more likely to get a criminal record for it. We need to fundamentally reform stop and frisk, and we need to change that law. And that's why I'm proud I've sponsored it. Mr. Y. Unlike all these candidates, I have done something about stop and frisk. I urged the police commissioner of the city of New York to do a study on stop and frisk. This was two years ago. Half a million dollars was set aside to look at stop and frisk. I wrote a policy position paper predicting that this would be the biggest public safety disaster in NYPD's history. To address that issue, people have to put it in context. When a police officer gets a call, that call could fit so many people. But what we don't realize about this problem, the people in the city of New York are not opposed to a police, somebody carrying a gun to be stopped. What they're opposed to and what they object is their rights being violated. Any policy that violates anybody's rights in this city without due process is wrong. So, so do you I'm believe- adamantly opposed to that kind of thing. But in terms of uh, in, uh, 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 appointing an inspector general, we have so many investigatory agencies. How am I gonna see the power of the city council which they have as public safety committee and the DA, attorney generals, they are all investigating police departments. So you just want to create another level of bureaucracy. We don't need it. It is a, 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 a political a, 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 a document that does not, this city doesn't need. Public safety is the number one priority. That's why I introduced the idea of my, uh, my, 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 okay. my cameras on police officers. And that would bring the, the, the stuff and freaks out of the window. Ms. James. I attended Howard University School of Law because I read a book called entitled Simple Justice. I'm a strong proponent of justice and a defender of the Constitution. I took an oath when I became a, uh, an elected official to uphold the Constitution. And it's unfortunate in the city of New York that four million African American and Latino men have been stopped and frisked illegally. 80% of them have been black and brown. 90% of them are totally innocent. They've done absolutely nothing wrong. Unfortunately, stop, question, and frisk in the city of New York has become a perverse rite of passage for little boys of color, and we need to end it. And so I'm a proud co-sponsor of the bills, and I look forward to overriding the mayor's veto. In addition to that, I filed an amicus brief in support of the law that was declared on constant, the decision, and um, look forward to joining another brief in opposition to the mayor's appeal on the Floyd case. I predicted that, in fact, the stop, question, and frisk would be unconstitutional. I advised the mayor, I advised the police commissioner that we, we had to move in a different direction. And the direction is as follows. We needed more community policing. What we needed to do is, is become embedded with the gangs because the problem is primarily related to gangs. What we needed to do is increase the number of police officers on our street, hire more individuals who are residents of the city of New York. I was the first member of the city council to put surveillance cameras all in the, my district and has resulted in a number of arrests in my community. In addition to that, we need to ban quotas and police officers need to fill out these, the forms, the 250s. As a former assistant attorney general, we were in the forefront of this almost 10 years ago where we investigated stop, question and, fisk, and frisk. And obviously as someone who is very much concerned about this abuse, it needs to end. It has no place in a civil society. And Ms. Lanjani. I mean, Kathy, stop and frisk may be a tool, but in New York City, it's a racist tool. And the judge's decision was a vindication of what we all knew, that stop and frisk in New York City is racist and it's wrong. And that people are being stopped with absolutely, for doing nothing wrong, there's no reasonable suspicion, which is why nine out of 10 stops don't result in any evidence at all. And what is the message that we are sending our young black men and brown men, that they can't walk the streets without being discriminated <clears throat> against? And see, I know what that's like as someone of color. You know, a few days before my eighth grade graduation, when I was 13 years old, I was beaten because of the color of my skin. And as I walked home or got dragged home, bloody and bruised, my mother just looked at me and she cried. But she didn't pick up the phone and call the police because she was scared. You know, my family came here as refugees and, and they've always been terrified of that. And so many families here in New York City are terrified of the police. And so the judge's decision gives us an opportunity to have a new era to build relationships. But as a next public advocate, let me be clear. I will be 
I will be fighting every single day to make sure that the judge's decision is enforced and we stop, stop and frisk in this city because it is racist and wrong as Thank implemented. You. Thank you. Just quickly, I want to give uh, Ms. Guerrero an opportunity, a very quick opportunity, 15 seconds to respond. Right. I, I will let her words speak for themselves. Thanks. Errol. We're up to the uh, cross-examination where we allow each of the candidates to um, ask a question of one of your opponents. We're going to start with Sadiq Y. Let me, I wanted to pose the question to my good friend, council member. When you talk about, everybody talks about community policing. Mm -hmm. What is your understanding of community policing? Could you explain to the city of New York what you mean by community policing? Sure. I want to thank you, Sadiq, for that question, because you stood with me at Ebbets Field when African immigrants were being abused, when they were being assaulted. You stood with me as we worked together with NYPD to resolve those issues. That's the type of community policing that we are discussing, where you and I held hands with NYPD so that immigrants, obviously, their rights would be protected and that they would be safe in the city of New York. You remember that there was a cultural difference. You remember that they, was they were afraid to reach out to government. You also recognize that they were afraid to reach out to NYPD. What we need are more community policing in the city of New York, individuals who are on the block, who walk the streets, who know the community, who know the community, who know um, the individuals who are engaging in crime. Because the reality is that the vast majority of African-American and Latino men and women are good individuals. And the, Af and the vast majority of the four million individuals in the city of New York who have been stopped and frisked illegally have done absolutely nothing wrong. And it's unfortunate that my brother, my nephew, my nephew who visited me from college, 18 years old, was stopped and frisked on his way to Brooklyn, that he curled up in bed in a fetal position and cried and said, Auntie, I did nothing wrong. He was humiliated. Countless number of African-American men go through that each and every day. We should not suspend the Constitution in communities of color. We should uphold the law and it should apply to all of us. And all of us as elected officials, including the mayor of the city of New York and the police commissioner, should recognize that the Constitution should be colorblind and that stop, question, and frisk has no place in a civil society. Thank you. Um, now you, Councilwoman, get to ask a question of one of your opponents. Sure. The question is to uh, Mr. Senator Daniel Squadron. Senator Squadron, you have embarked upon a million dollar campaign ad where you are basically taking credit for bringing results to your community. But in reality, in the last two years, none of the bills that you have passed become law. And in fact, you lied to your constituents about building luxury towers in a public park. Senator Squadron, why did you deceive your constituents? Well, the facts underlying the question are, are just not right. Uh, I have passed uh, more than one bill into law in the last couple of years, and uh, many more than that in my time in office, including a bill that uh, federalizes public housing, which means we get $75 million <clears throat> a year from the federal government to stabilize it when it was going bankrupt, because the city and the state had stopped doing their job and funding it passed uh, ethics reform legislation to make it a crime to use your government office to enrich yourself. I passed a bill to create a, a whole new kind of corporation in New York State. But, uh, you know, I think most importantly uh, to your question, I'm really proud of the work that I've done to combat gun violence. My bill to ban assault weapons in the state became law as part of the SAFE Act, which was passed with Governor Cuomo's leadership and the leadership of so many others across the state. Even before the tragedy in Newtown, I was calling for a special session to deal with the scourge of gun violence. Because as tragic and shocking as Newtown was, and it was, equally tragic and shocking is the daily barrage of, of tragedy that happens on our streets every day. In January, a 16-year-old in my district was shot dead walking home from a convenience store. The rumor is it's because folks thought his jacket was cool. We need to do something about gun violence. I'm proud of the work I've done, and I'm really proud that Senator Schumer has endorsed me in this race and uh, has been supportive of that effort. And uh, briefly, Mr. Squadron, there was a question in there as well about, I, I believe, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's talk about Brooklyn Bridge Park. When I was elected, there was a done deal for Brooklyn Bridge Park that I had a problem with. I thought it was overly reliant on uh, housing and a couple of development sites. So I got in the middle of that. And I was able to reduce and delay the housing. But I was able to do something else as well. 
I got the city to put $65 million into Brooklyn Bridge Park, getting it built more quickly, adding amenities, including a swimming pool that's open today and I highly recommend you go to with your kids this weekend. And you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park isn't a park unto itself. It's part of what I call a harbor park, a central park in the center of the city linked with Governor's Island, the Queens and North Brooklyn waterfronts, the west side of Manhattan, and a pier on the east side of Manhattan, surrounded entirely by public housing and subsidized housing where Senator Schumer and I were able to get more than $15 million to make sure that community wasn't left out of what we're doing as we transform the waterfront. Thank you. Resh, Ms. Johnny, your question. So I'm trying to ask a simple yes or no question to see if it works. Um, Councilwoman James, yes. have you ever taken a campaign contribution from a developer or their spouse or someone the developer asked to contribute to you while at the same time deciding on a project of theirs. So Mr. Johnny, I don't think I'll take any ethics lesson from a Wall Street lawyer who hired a consultant to brush all of her past experience and her past employment on Wall Street. The fact that you worked for hedge funds consistently hedge funds who in fact engaged in subprime mortgages, individuals who lost their homes. You, in fact, worked for Wall Street all of your life, and there's no reference to your history on the Internet because you hired a consultant paying them $50,000. So I'm not going to take any ethics lessons from a Wall Street lawyer who, in fact, has worked for uh, basically a, the bad list of players on Wall Street. Clearly, uh, Ms. you want to raise this as an issue, and I don't think we, we should talk about gotcha politics. What we really should talk about are issues that people care about, Reshma. We should talk about the crisis in affordable housing. We should talk about the subprime mortgage I guess debacle. that means I'm not getting a yes or no. We should talk about all of the issues that people care about. We should talk about <laughs> the fact that a significant number of women have gone to deceptive clinics for reproductive services and ha not received them. We should talk about pay equity. We should talk about health clinics. We, we should talk about all of the in initiatives that I created in the city, city council. Infant mortality, a food pantry, asthma initiative. Should I go on? Should we talk about the scandal that I uncovered where we recovered $500 million for taxpayers? Can we talk about the sick leave no, bill that I co-sponsored? <laughs> I guess you shouldn't go on, uh, if, that's, if that's your response. I'd like to respond. Um, Kathy Guerrero gets to ask a question. Can I actually respond since I've been personally attacked? No, ma'am. Well, you just saw a preview of what just occurred over the last year. These three fighting in amongst themselves on all, on, on all sorts of small political minutia, this and that. And while they fight against each other, I have fought for New York City. For the last year and a half of 15 months, I have listened a thousand meetings to the, to the residents in Rockaways who said, I need more transportation, to the residents of Bay Ridge who say, Kathy, I, uh, take care of this ticket place, for Staten Islanders who get eviscerated by that toll, for small business owners, every single neighborhood in New York City, for children in Harlem, for children in East New York when parents say, my kingdom for a good school. But the answer to your question, while well, they fight in and amongst themselves, well, I have a question for my friend on the end of the aisle, Sadiq, and we are friends, <laughs> as the other non-politician in this race, do you agree with me that the whole point, the aegis of control of the next public advocate should be outside of the rubric of public authority and of political gotcha? Kathy, my answer is absolutely yes. And let me tell you why. When people, all of my colleagues, they are wonderful public servants, but look at the monies that they have raised and look at the people who have given them money. This city, is not up for sale. Mm. We need an outsider, complete outsider, who is not going to be beholding to special interest groups because that's what we see today. Many of these people have what they call legislative initiative funds. The NGOs in this city, in this city, do not get a nickel if you are not part of their political club. And yet the people are providing valuable services in the city. We don't need professional politicians to be a public advocate. They, in fact, it's contradictory. When you are professional politicians, you are beholding. When you are an advocate, you're free. So let's look at someone, look at people on, this, on these days with all good, good intentions that they have, somebody that is going to have the credibility and the capacity to bring people together to serve all communities all people, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their status in life, regardless of the kind of money that they have. Too much money has gone to people who actually trying to get their message. I look at the polls. 
We haven't even been able to get any of that. We should, we should, we should move away from professional politicians and get people politicians to be in elected office. People politicians. Okay, thank you. Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is for Councilmember James. Yes. Uh, uh, alone among candidates in this race, I don't accept uh, political action committee contributions. I've also offered a uh, pledge to the other candidates in this race uh, to uh, forswear any, uh, uh, any uh, independent expenditures. Uh, these are the outside dollars that undermine a good campaign finance system like ours. It's modeled on the pledge taken by Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown in their Massachusetts U.S. Senate race, and it has an actual enforceability mechanism. Would you be willing to sign the pledge? So, um, Senator, let me just say that I, too, am not going to take uh, ethics class from an individual who represents, uh, who come from Albany, the most dysfunctional legislature in the nation of the city of New in the nation. Let me also go on to say, Senator Squadron, obviously I have served as a public defender. I have served as an assistant attorney general where I sued a significant number of businesses that were engaging in deceptive business practice. I've been a counsel for a countless number of individuals who unfortunately are indigent in the city of New York. And I've served in 10 years in the city council where I have raised the issue with respect to the mayor of the city of New York over the third term extension. Where were you in regards to the third term extension? I was one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit filed by the current public advocate with respect to the illegal extension of the third term in violation of the will of the people of the city of New York. And countless number of times I've stood up on behalf of New Yorkers in the city of New York. Those without a voice, those are disenfranchised, those who live in the margins in the city of New York. My credentials, my integrity is without question, Senator, and the reality is I will not take, I will not uh, accept a ethics question from someone who represents the most dysfunctional legislative house in this nation. Okay, before we move on, I did want to give uh, Reshman said, I was, it was a time management question more than okay. anything. I wanted to make sure everybody got their question in, but um, you, you were, in fact, um, uh, referred attacked. to by your opponent, Thank and I'll you. give you a chance to respond. Um, let me be really clear about my record and where I come from. I was a lawyer working in financial services. I didn't foreclose on homes. I didn't trade stocks. I didn't make investment decisions. And there are some corrupt people in Wall Street, and they should be in jail. But there's also some good working people who work in financial services. And all these attacks about Wall Street, they're just distractions because people don't want to talk about what their plan is. My record about how I feel about financial regulation has always been clear. I said Dodd-Frank didn't go far enough, that we need to regulate credit agencies, that we need to have a CRA that is stronger so banks aren't taking advantage of vulnerable communities. And if there's ever, ever a question about my commitment to public service, which has been lifelong, because I come from nothing. My family came here as refugees. I went to school and got a lot of student loan debt, and I'm still paying for it. I'm still helping my father pay for his mortgage. That's who I am. And if there's ever a question about my public service, I ask you to meet Maria Gonzalez, who went to the Girls Who Code program. I ask you to speak to Kamari Hutchinson, who is one of my undocumented students who has gone to CUNY because of what I did. I ask you to speak to Tamba Aguiles, who I got pro bono for asylum for pro bono. There are countless people in this city that I have helped. And you probably met a lot of them outside when they were cheering for us. Because we have an army of people that I have served, and I have served my whole life. Okay, thank you. Um, folks, we're, we are up to the, uh, the lightning round. I'm going to ask the candidates a series of questions where you can answer only one word, yes or no. And let's start with uh, you, Senator Squadron. Good. <laughs> Do you support term limits for New York City elected officials? Uh, I don't think that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start again. Off to a bad start. Yeah. Yes. Kathy Guerrero. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Yes. Okay. Ms. Ms. Guerrero, yes. should the MTA sell naming rights to its subway stops? <laughs> no. No. I support that, yes. And in fact, um, on Skimmerhorn Street, I, five years ago, I said you should name it Michael Jackson because that's where he filmed his famous movie, his famous video, Beat It. <laughs> Mr. Y. Only if it is relevant to the development of that community. Senator. Yes. Okay. Ms. Johnny, have you ever bought a scalped ticket? <laughs> no. No. James. No. Senator. No. No. Oh. 
<laughs> We're all boring. Um, um, Councilwoman James, we'll yes. start here. Should residents who are not citizens be allowed to vote in New York City elections? Yes. Why? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Senator. Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, Mr. Y, we'll start here. Have you ever voted for Michael Bloomberg? <laughs> yes. No. 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 Okay, back to Senator Squadron. Have you ever had work done on your home without getting a permit? No. 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 <laughs> okay. Ms. Guerrero, have you ever shopped at Walmart? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Senator yes. <laughs> and uh, we're up to Reshma Shaljani. Do you like the Nets more than the Knicks? Oh, geez. <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I watch the Knicks more. <laughs> Nets or Knicks? You know the answer to that. <laughs> yes. I like them both. <laughs> I live in Brooklyn, but I'm still Knicks. Knicks? Oh, Knicks. Look at that. Um, Chase James, have you ever personally sued anyone? Yes. <laughs> yes, sir? Me? Personally sued anyone? Me? Yes. No. So, no. Nope. No. Okay. And Mr. Y, have you ever called 311 for help? No. I work for the police department. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. No. Ms. James, no. <laughs> and finally, um, Senator, do you support school? Actually, I got a couple more here. Let's go. Oh, good. Do you support schools um, distributing morning after pills without parental consent? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. No. Hmm. And Ms. Guerrero gets the last one. Well, we'll start the last one. Should the city ban horse carriages from Central Park? No. Ms. Johnny? Yes. Uh, Council Member Melissa Mark Riverita is here. She's a sponsor of the bill, and I'm a co-sponsor. Yes. No. Yes. Senator. Okay. Thanks very much. We're going to try and get as many uh, questions as we can in the remainder <coughs> of our debate time before we get to closing statements. Let's go back to Brian Lehrer. Thanks, Errol. And Ms. Guerrero, up to you for the Hi. first response in this round. In the first round, three of you said you would target the education department as the first agency that needs improvement in the city. And I'd like to hear all of you now go a little bit more into that. Um, given the real limits of the power and resources of the public advocate, how would you use the job of public advocate to improve the public schools? Right. Well, I'm glad to see my colleagues jumping on the bandwagon of actually caring about children in the classroom, things I've been talking about expertly for the last 15 months. But there is a unique space for the public advocate to think about children in and outside of the classroom. We can look at the uh, parent coordinators and strengthen that within the context of, the, of changing the law. The law's got to be changed. We also need to shift the focus away from single measure testing and look at more portfolio testing. A, a public advocate who actually knows something with four teachers, my mother and father, New York City public school teachers both, two of my six siblings, New York City public school teachers, I know that the conversation, the context of how we talk about teachers has been disgusting and a public advocate with a particular type of voice can actually lift this and shift the conversation. Mr. Squadron. Yes. So I talked a little bit about community education councils, the parent voices uh, in the system that the public advocate needs to take on and help give a citywide platform to. The truth is a bureaucracy will never want to empower an outside group of uh, parents and that's where the public advocate comes in. You know, we're also undergoing a major transition in how kids with special needs are educated in the city school system. The current public advocate has played an oversight role as that transition has begun. And I would continue that as public advocate because uh, too often the school system uh, leaves behind those with special needs or who are Engli English language learners. The third category, 12,000 foster kids in the system, about 21,000 uh, homeless kids right now. That's 33,000 kids whose uh, lives in, in their personal lives are upended in, in significant ways. I don't think the school system does enough to make sure that what's happening at home doesn't impact what's happening at school. Thank and I would you, focus Mr. on that Mr. as well. Y, and forgive me for jumping in, but we need to keep these to under a minute each for time. Mr. Y? Yeah. Well, I, my first action would be I said I would look at the NYPD, having understood but the question is about education. What would you do as public advocate to improve the public schools? The first thing I will do 
is to clearly not just talk about parental involvement in name only, but to making sure that any principal of any school will have an independent parent advocate attached to their school. Second, I will also move to introducing what we, we call the science, education, math, and, and, and technology portion of this. Because if we don't start investing in our younger kids, particularly preparing them for these technological uh, uh, development companies, it's just going to be something that is going to be. So I will really bring teachers, parents, and school administrators together to work Thank together. Thank you, Ms. James. First, um, as the next public advocate, I would demand of the governor of the state of New York that we get our fair share of funding uh, in re regards to the campaign for fiscal, fiscal equity lawsuit. Two, I would urge that there be a moratorium on the closing of public schools. Three, a moratorium on co-locations with charter schools. Three, we are currently in violation of federal law with regards to physical education. We need physical education back in our schools. Four, there was a waiver that was just an announced. The mayor of the city of New York is seeking a, uh, a waiver with regards to having a librarian in every school. I would oppose that waiver, and I have already begun to write a letter, and we'll be speaking at the hearing in opposition to that waiver. We need more arts and culture in every classroom. We need to focus on STEM, science technology, um, um, the um, engineering and math, and we, most of all, need small classroom size. We need to respect teachers as professionals that they are. And Ms. Uh, Johnny. I think it's great that both Sadiq and, and Tish talked about STEM because it is very important. Uh, in 2010, I saw how we have 300,000 jobs that are open in the computing-related fields, but less than 20% of our workforce is prepared to fill them. So many of our children are trapped in this technology gap. So I did something about it. I built Girls Who Code, which is an eight-week program which helps build websites and mobile apps, teaches young girls ages 16 and 17 how to do that. Two weeks ago, my girls met with Cheryl Sandberg, and they were sitting around this conference room, and she walked by, and they screamed like she was Beyonce. And forgive me, and they with modeled, respect to the education yes, department? Yes, and they modeled the apps that she had built. So I would take what I've done with Girls Who Code and put it into the classroom. I've already drafted legislation with Andy Hevesy that we've introduced in Albany to have computer science fulfill a science requirement. Okay. I have launched with the U of T, Teachers Who Code, to get teachers into the classroom who can train on computer science. And finally, I've made the commitment as the next public advocate to get CS education in every single public school and to get our technology companies okay. to build schools here in Southeast Queens, in Fort Greene, and East Harlem so we can train our kids for the jobs of the future. Thank you all very much. I've got a, a quick question. If you can um, do it in less than a minute, like 30 seconds, uh, we can uh, <laughs> both get an answer to it and um, also get to your closing statements. Um, this is a, an office, the Public Advocates Office, that has a budget of $2.2 million. Yeah. It has been cut year after year after year. You all have talked about very expansively uh, with long lists about things that you want to do, the ombudsman's function, the legislative function, uh, the advocacy function as a whole. What would you do specifically about uh, the budget, the resource limitations that would really cripple many of the initiatives that you would like to promise to us? Let's start with Senator Squadron. Uh, look, you know, I've laid out a very specific plan for this office to help the most vulnerable, those who are often left behind, children, to advocate for more and better housing options, to make sure that the bureaucracy is held accountable. We have 20 specific ideas within those four bureaus, and I encourage you to look at them because they're all very much within the scope of the office, and they're focused on getting results that change people's lives. That's what I focused on in office, and that's what I'd like to focus on as the public advocate. You know what you do about the budget? You make the office essential for folks who need it. And then advocates and elected officials and the public will say that those projects, those programs need to be expanded. But you also need to know how to make the office effective, meaningful, and results-oriented within the current budget. Thank you. Kathy Guerrero. I've been planning to run for this office for 20 years, so you better hope I have a plan to actually exponentialize the role of the office. And we've put together something that we call the think tank, which will add an additional 50, five zero people into the office, uh, research fellows, graduate students that will come for the low, low price of a desk and a laptop. And what they will do is help me to churn out three months, six month, one year snapshot studies that will put teeth around an office, an often confused job that people say, who is the public advocate and what do they do? And you take these studies and you allow them to inform the conversation so I'm not just railing to the gods but I know something and I'm communicating it with data and information and clearly knowing me a little bit of aggression just a little <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
I've been the Deputy Public Advocate. I faced this crisis of not having a budget and not having a staff. And the reality is, unfortunately, you know, Daniel, the money's not just going to come. And the think tank that we do have in the office is called the Fund for Public Advocacy. And it has to be resourced. And that's what I did. I raised an additional million dollars because if I, I didn't do that, we weren't going to send these undocumented students to college. We weren't going to be able to help our immigrant entrepreneurs. We weren't going to be able to launch a campaign on, against Citizens United. We weren't going to be able to launch a study on special education. Taxpayers don't have the stomach to fund the office. It's just the reality. And I know some, Tish has talked about that city council members have agreed to fund the office. I still haven't seen who those folks are. But Bill de Blasio was very popular as a city councilman, and he was unable to really get the budget increased to the point it was at Mark Green. So you have to bring resources into the office. And I partnered with CUNY, with Wagner, with the Center for Urban Future. And I'm the only one who's standing here who knows how to do that because we need to fight for our most vulnerable. They need us. And we need a public advocate who's gonna fight for them. Very briefly, Ms. James. The office should be independently funded. It should not be tied to the whims of the Speaker of the City Council as well as the Mayor of the City of New York. Just as IBO filed a lawsuit, a famous lawsuit, in fact, which resulted in a landmark case where IBO's budget is tied to the budget of the City of New York, the Office of Public Adv Advocate should be treated the same. We should be independent of the Mayor, we should be independent of the City Council, and we should have our own budget and our own legal counsel in the City of New York. Thank you. And um, Mr. Y, I, for time reasons, I'm not going to allow you to uh, respond to that one because we're going into closing statements. You get to go first with your closing statements. First of all, I think you cheated me on one minute, so, but that's all right. <laughs> this job, as you've heard all of these people speak about their background and experiences. I am not a politician. I come from a background leaving a small country in West Africa, coming here with $5 in my pocket and with God and a dream and God on my side, moving from that position to holding several important influential positions in the city. I have put my life on the line for New Yorkers. I have brought communities together. I have brought about a unification of people who don't even talk to each other. This office is not an office where you're going to talk about just standing there, you whip a magic hand. You need to have someone who could bring people together, work together, and understanding the fact that they are all part of New York. There is absolutely unacceptable that a city of immigrants, almost 40% of all the people here are immigrants, yet there is not a single African foreign born in city council, state assembly, the federal government. That's got to change. There is no Muslim, no Muslim practicing Muslim in the city council. Thank you. We got to change that and give li religious liberty to people. So I thank you very much. First, let me just say to the family of Bill Lynch, my condolences. I am because he was. And I want to welcome and thank all of you for coming to the district. And I want to thank you for hosting this. I grew up not too far from BAM. I grew up uh, playing stickball and jumping double dutch. My parents come from humble beginnings. My father was a janitor. My mother swept floors. I remember as a young child, my mother took me to criminal court when my brother was falsely arrested. And I remember how the criminal court system transformed my life because everyone in the courtroom did not look like me except for the defendants. And I wanted to change that picture. I read a book called Simple Justice and went to Howard University because Howard University graduates not only scholars but social engineers. I came back and graduated, became a public defender, former assistant attorney general, former counsel, and now a member of the New York City Council now for 10 years. I passed the Safe Housing Act so tenants can improve conditions. I stood up against the mayor on the third term extension, which was illegal because most New Yorkers um, had voted not once but twice. I've stood up against the mayor with regards to abuses related to stop and frisk, as well as on ensuring that women receive reproductive uh, services in the city of New York. I will stand up for all New Yorkers and stand up to powerful interests. I will make sure all voices are heard. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnny. I stand here as the daughter of immigrants. I know what it's like to translate for my mother. I know what it's like to get an education I can't afford. I know what it's like to send money home every month to my family. We need a public advocate who is going to fight for you, who is going to fight for our most vulnerable, women, children, immigrants, seniors, and our vets. And as a deputy public advocate, that's what I did. 
I created the Dream Fellowship and sent undocumented students to college. I founded Girls Who Code so that our young women aren't going to be trapped in the technology gap. Bill Lynch, Bill Lynch too, has been a mentor to me over the past couple of months, and he taught me that politics should be a noble profession. We need people desperately right now, especially right now in the mix of all the scandal, who are going to stand up for the right thing, who are going to actually get things done, and not just say they do things, but really get things done. And I will be out there because I'm already out there on every corner and every borough and every neighborhood fighting for you because I'm Rush Masajani and I am one of you. Thank you. Ms. Guerrero. My name is Kathy Guerrero and I am your next public advocate. Your next public advocate will not come from the rank and file of politics and politicians as usual. I'm a working class kid from Brooklyn and Staten Island. My father had two full-time union jobs. He was a teacher, he'd come home, he changed his clothes, he worked the four to 12 shift, seven days a week as a longshoreman. My brothers and sisters, teachers and firemen and cops, I stand on their shoulders and I am tired of the working class and the working poor and the middle class being removed from power of their own story. My name is Kathy Guerrero. I am very proudly the union candidate in this race. I stand for their contracts to be held harm harmless. I am very proud to be the faith-based candidate. Dozens and dozens of faith-based leaders of all faiths wrap their minds and hearts around my candidacy. I am proud to be a fighter. I am proud to be an educator. I am thrilled to be somebody's mother. This, ladies and gentlemen, New York City is very, very, very personal to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for watching tonight and thank you for hosting. The public advocate has the potential to play a vital role in this city for communities who most need it. Exactly the kinds of communities and individuals I've been talking about. Every New Yorker who deals with a bureaucracy that doesn't deliver results effectively enough, that isn't transparent and responsive enough. I'm running for public advocate because I believe this is an office that can be all about results, and that's what I've done in office so far. When people in my district said the F train was getting worse, I didn't just complain about it. I worked with the MTA to create a mechanism called a full line review that's improved the F train, the L train, the G train, and now is going to get used across the system. When public housing residents in my district, more than 40,000 I represent, didn't have a citywide organizing voice, I helped create a citywide organizing campaign, passed a bill to get $75 million a year from the federal government, and even changed the way the city uh, fixes cooking gas when it goes out. The public advocate must deliver for those who no one else is delivering for. It can't chase the parade of politicians. It needs to take on the things that most politicians don't. Thank you. Thank you very much, candidates. That is all the time we have for this debate. I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us tonight. And here's a reminder, primary day is on September 10th, and the general election, of course, is on November 5th. Voter registration deadlines are right upon us. If you want to cast your ballot in a primary, you must be registered by tomorrow. We are the sponsors of the next Campaign Finance Board debate, and uh, that happens next Wednesday. The seven Democratic candidates from mayor will square off for 90 minutes at 7 p.m. That's at Town Hall. And another reminder, along with those debates, the Campaign Finance Board is printing the city's official nonpartisan New York City voter guide. It also produces a video voter guide and has introduced a new mobile platform. It's called nycvotes.org, which makes election and candidate information available right at your fingertips. That's all available at the board's website website, which is www.nyc-cfb.info. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great evening.